everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. Hope you guys are staying safe and indoors out there. And at least while trapped at home, we can watch tons of horror movies. On this ending explained, we'll be looking at the psychedelic cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft's Color Out of Space, where a meteorite lands on the Gardner family farm and they find themselves battling a mutant extraterrestrial organism that infects their minds and bodies, transforming their quiet rural life into a technicolor nightmare. Color Out of Space has a lot going for it, including another dynamic and and over-the-top performance from Nicolas Cage. Tons of trippy visuals and colors and a nice helping of body horror to boot. All jammed together into one memorable and quite out there experience. It's perhaps a little overly arty at points and does take a while to get going, but once things become unleashed, it just gets better and more involving as the family begin being affected by their interstellar visitor. It's also worth noting that this is Richard Stanley's first directing gig since getting fired from the island of Dr. Moreau all the way back in 1996. And Stanley is perhaps best known for his post-apocalyptic Western hardware. Definitely worth a look if you haven't seen it. And it's exciting to have him back after all these years with a quite assured hand and puts together most likely the best H.P. Lovecraft movie adaptation to date. You can tell that he is a huge fan of the author and apparently has been since even a child when his mom read Lovecraft's works to him. Well, that's one way to put your kid to bed. Hope you like nightmares of inexplicable evil from the beyond. Jeez, there's quite a lot to look at with this one, especially once things reach their otherworldly climax that leaves us with a lot more questions than answers. So let's dive into Color Out of Space, breaking down the story, the powers and properties behind the mysterious meteorite, as well as explaining the ending that hints that things aren't quite as over as it appears. In the ancient, supposedly cursed rolling hills of the fictional town of Arkham, Massachusetts, the setting of several of Lovecraft's works, lives the Gardner family. First meeting Wiccan daughter Lavinia in the middle of a ritual, calling upon higher powers to remove her mother's cancer. And where better to get some quality incantations than the Necronomicon, aka the Book of the Dead, another of Lovecraft's creations that has popped up in many other stories, including, of course, the Evil Dead trilogy. She's interrupted by hydrologist Ward, sporting a Miskatonic University sweater, also featured in many Lovecraft works, and is the setting of Herbert West the Reanimator. He's surveying the land as the town is in the process of building a massive reservoir which will cover the entire area including the Gardner farm and water and it seems that father Nathan has been resistant to sell the farm which once belonged to his father and the family moved out here to get away from the hustle and bustle of big city life which for the most part the family seems okay with and do generally get along even if the parents do come across as a bit overprotective with Teresa ill it's up to Nathan to tend to the family including cooking even if he's not exactly the best at it and she is still focused on her obvious high-stress job involving stock trading, working with clients in a makeshift office in the attic, unfortunately having some difficulties with the signal due to their remote location. Although they are still happy to be out here, having done some work to make the place their own. Nathan and Teresa feeling they are finally living their dream, which for some odd reason also includes alpaca farming. Nathan convinced that they are the animals of the future. Okay, sure, if you say so, I'll take 10. Though their idyllic dream is about to be shattered. That night, Benny's computer starts glitching. The house begins begins to rattle, as up in space, a single formation with a magenta cloud barrier around it appears. The magenta color synonymous with this entity was chosen for a specific reason, as it does not exist from a single wavelength on the color spectrum of visible light, and instead is only perceived by humans in a specific interaction of the optic rods in their eyes that detect red and blue colors to create the magenta color in their minds, which actually we'll see comes to have a pretty important overall meaning to our story. The light begins to brightly flood the area, building to an explosion of light, and little Jack screams. Then things appear back to normal. Wondering if it was an earthquake or something, the family finds a glowing purple rock still smoking in the ground. Jack seems quite affected, worried that he's in shock. He eventually snaps out of it, while Nathan is preoccupied by a foul smell that still lingers in the air. The next day, the mayor and the sheriff show up to survey the rock for themselves, all trying to figure out what it is. But beyond it coming from space, they don't have a clue, which is generally the idea with Lovecraft stories, unexplainable cosmic horror. And this entity, which is neither good nor bad, is never truly identified by design. There's also an interesting thing to consider as to why the meteor landed here. Ward asking Lavinia if it was potentially due to her ritual. She laughs it off, but she was meddling with the forces of evil, and that certainly could be why their farm was chosen for its crash location. Ward learns there is someone else living on the property, their so-called squatter Ezra, who lives
lives way off the grid, entirely set up with solar power and cameras covering his shed. And as played by Tommy Chong, he's a huge stoner as well. No surprise there, who somehow already knows Ward to his confusion as they haven't met. But according to Ezra, there's little birdies floating around the ecosphere. You just gotta know how to decode them. Okay, sure dude, you're stoned off your ass, aren't you? Offering him some coffee, it appears a little funky, thinking that it might be rust, but it's straight from the well and normally wouldn't look like that this time of year. Our first indication of the effects of the rock's presence, which grows in intensity over time, in particular after a storm rolls in and the rock is struck several times by magenta lightning, causing the rock to glow all kinds of colors, realizing it's actually drawing the lightning to it. This appears to destroy the rock, but also allows whatever is contained within to seep into the earth, which begins to have massive repercussions for the area, including affecting electricity, the vegetation, and yes, even time itself. Ward, by himself, gets our first indicator of the effect it has on electricity, causing his radio signal to suddenly die. And when getting a phone call, it's just static on the other end that gets louder, showing us things aren't going to be working normally in the radius of the rock. And hearing rustling in the woods sees some weird purple ambience moving amongst the trees, shimmering colorful shadows. His car roars to life, the engine revving and just as abruptly shuts off, his radio then crackling oddly back to life. It seems that the source of the cosmic energy is now in the well and things spread from that area outwards. The next day beginning to see how it affects living things as well. A brilliantly bright lizard seen by the well, in addition to some new foreign looking vegetation beginning to sprout up. Although the rock is gone, which is unfortunately time for the family. As the press circus roll in, and without any evidence, assume Nathan is just an old coot ranting about UFOs, even referring to him as an amateur bourbon connoisseur after mentioning he did have a few drinks, but was still sober when the meteor crashed. The effects begin to extend to the family's behavior as well, through not just the obviously contaminated water, but the general radius itself. Teresa appears in a daze in the kitchen preparing to cook, cracking a bloody and off-looking egg into a bowl, and proceeds to absentmindedly cut a carrot and slices the tips of her fingers off without even batting an eye, holding up her hand all bloody and informing the family that dinner is ready. Oh boy, this is gonna get weird, isn't it? Nathan rushes her to the hospital, leaving the kids on their own and tasking Benny with putting the alpacas away and of course giving them some water from the well. Although he did put them away as instructed, Lavinia is having some probably also tainted coffee and sees the animals are all out again. Benny insists that he did put them up despite how it looks, implying he did put them in but now is showing them from before he did, as time here is affected as well. She notes Jack peering into the well, telling her he's talking to someone down there as the tainted coffee takes hold. Her stomach starts angrily rumbling. In getting a call from Nathan, it has the same effect as Ward's earlier call, only a garbled signal coming through, then what sounds like screaming. Jack seems to have a particularly close relationship with the entity, drawing what it potentially looks like, a weird purple mass and tons of branches or tentacles reaching out all around it, similar to how it's dramatically changing the environment here, beginning to grow and grow out from the well radius. Getting another example when an egg at the bottom of the well opens up, birthing a purple bug that flies off. Lavinia sets out to clean up her mom's mess, chanting to herself to not puke. The clock ticking grows bizarrely loud and slows down, eventually stopping completely. Light washes over her, seeing some of the entity is in the water, pouring from the faucet, and looking at the clock, hours have gone by without explanation. Lavinia is still standing at the sink, and as we understand, time is also being affected by the energy. Ward shows up with a warning about the water contamination, and she has to run off to puke again, him yelling to not drink the water. Too late for that, I'm afraid. He pays another visit to Ezra, also to warn him about the water, and finds him on the ground listening to a recording of what he says are the chattering and shuffling of people under the floor, or rather, aliens. Ward listens to the recording for himself, hearing static and ringing similar to those distorted phone calls. He's not quite convinced of Ezra's ramblings, and suggests he get out of here, confident everything will make more sense in the morning. Ezra is confused, informing him it's already the morning. Time again shifting randomly around, it seems. His cat G-Spot is also missing, Ward saying he'll keep an eye out for her, but Ezra warns even if he does see her, he might not recognize her. Oh boy, what does that mean? Suddenly nighttime, Nathan and Teresa make their way back from the hospital, him doing some exaggerated operatic singing for some weird reason, and they freak out when seeing something running into the road. What certainly looks like a giant mutated cat, now a larger and much more exotic looking creature than a typical 
Earth Cat. As Ezra suggested, this is most likely G-Spot, who has been physically changed by the energy. And it looks like Jack is exclusively outside playing with his so-called new friends now, and is joined by their dog Sam, as purple lights again overwhelm, the loud whistling agitating Sam who runs off barking, a kind of concentrated energy scene floating by. Then hearing the dog barking in pain, Jack just kind of sitting there in a trance. And Benny gets his own time bending experience while looking for his dog, returning to the house and telling his sister that he got lost, saying one second it was daytime, then suddenly so dark that he couldn't find the house. And they become concerned about Jack, who is still outside, the siblings rushing out just as their parents finally get home. They're pissed about leaving Jack out here by himself, and seeing the alpacas out again gets Nathan even more upset, and kind of flips his lid asking if he knows how much they cost, and decides to put them away himself. His demeanor changes along with his voice, now sounding like his unique inflection from way back in Vampire's Kiss. Nothing has been fucking this place up. Just as with Mommy absentmindedly slicing her finger, the energy has brought out the more aggressive and angry aspects of Nathan's personality. There's a few mentions of his father being abusive, with Nathan doing his best to be nothing like him. And assumedly, that's also what we're seeing a bit of here. Still agitated, he goes to take a shower, the pipes taking a moment to get going, and sees something odd clogging the drain, a gelatinous blob of sorts. He picks it up, a bunch of little branches shooting out into his hand, which he drops immediately, but certainly being stabbed into his skin is also going to begin changing him as well. Nathan's still obsessed with the weird smell, even though they insist they clean everything. And Teresa has other pressing concerns, needing to get online so she can get back to work. Nathan calms down, assuring them everything is going to be okay. Which I gotta say, does not seem to be on the table with all the increasingly weird shit going on around here. Of course, being on a farm, Nathan is also trying to grow some sweet, sweet tomatoes, listening to an instructional tape to make sure he does everything step of the procedure correctly, although the energy has done the hard work for him, producing some exceptionally large crops. And a month early too, he notes, impressed, seeing here a lot more hyper-colored growth on the ground. Even the crops have been changed fundamentally by their cosmic visitor. And as we might expect, they are rotten inside, which Nathan learns when doing a taste test in the kitchen. When Teresa comes down frustrated again about the internet not working, also a result of the energy, he takes a bite from each and every one, and is disgusted, losing his temper and throwing them all into the trash. She can't take it anymore, growling for him to fix the dish. And Nathan calms himself again, telling her it's a good idea, sweetie, and helps himself to a nice drink of bourbon. Though even the ice cubes here being a problem as they're made from the same cursed well water. While there have been some subtle rumblings of a reservoir being built in the area, a TV commercial featuring the mayor lady showcases this massive change front and center, also seeing its potential impact in a shot of a dead fish. But Nathan is distracted with other matters. The skin on his arms has started cracking due to that thing poking him, which he tends to by rubbing some bourbon on. Yeah, that'll do the trick. That night while everyone is asleep, Jack is awoken by the telltale whistling sound, joining Benny outside to take in the color's beauty, while their sister, who is packing to leave the farm, decides on a different tactic, going back to her faithful Necronomicon and trying a different ritual, setting up a circle of candles and pleading for help and protection, which apparently requires some flesh sacrifice, taking a box cutter to her arm, begging to get me out of here, blood dripping down onto the book's pages, and keeps going with more cuts. Dang, this thing needs a lot of blood to work. Yeesha Roni. Hearing the alpacas bleeding, Benny and Jack journey to the barn, and when approaching their cage, it's not looking too good. All the animals have fused together into one big fleshy mound, a certain reference to the thing, I would imagine. A purple wave starts emanating out, branches chasing after them back outside. Teresa joins them just as Jack falls to the ground, embracing her son, and the entirety of the energy branches flow right into them, which as we probably suspect is not a good thing. Nathan coming out to the scene and approaching them in horror and disbelief, because just as with his precious alpacas, Jack and Teresa have physically fused together, their son now sticking out of her back, and eyes glowing a magenta shade, joined by a much calmer looking Lavinia, covered in scratches and blood. Yeah, this family is not doing so well at the moment. The next morning, a purple haze is now floating 
flying in the air covering everything. Nathan attempts to start the car, and as expected, it doesn't work. And he's a little miffed about it, having a total cuckoo cage rage freak out at his misfortune. <laughs> Yet when he gets out, it really is quite beautiful, you know, the entire vicinity now completely changed by the meteorite's infiltration. So what if it causes a little mutation and madness too? It's fine. It's li it looks nice. The kids are starting to get the picture here. When trying to figure out how this is even happening, Lavinia understands the meteorite changed everything around it. Benny also realizes that this applies to not just matter, but time as well, stretching things around it like a black hole. And a defeated Nathan comes in with bad news about the car. Lavinia asking him if he believes something is finally happening here, but he admits he doesn't even know what he believes anymore. I can't really blame him there. Daylight is now streaming through the windows, seeming to burn the mother-son fusion, groaning painfully and their flesh sizzling. So the family work together to drag the monstrosity upstairs into the attic that Teresa once used as her office. Teresa moaning and mumbling incoherently, while Fusion Jack screams like a baby. Jeez, it's getting pretty rough going around here. Lavinia thinks, hey, they could probably use some water but no, no damn water, girl. Although at this point, to be fair, she, like everything else, has been tainted by the cosmic force, so she's probably not thinking exactly too straight at this juncture. Nathan, too, continues to try to keep things under control. When informed something happened to the alpacas, he loads up a shotgun and heads to the barn, opening fire on the mutated mass, screaming insanely while blowing it to pieces. Aw, oh, man, it's poor alpacas. I guess you could still get some sweet alpaca meat if you wanted. No sweaters, though, probably. No one is going to want to wear a piece of clothing made out of that mess. Back in the attic, Lavinia actually does give her mom some water, lapping it out of a bowl like a dog, which is certainly only going to speed along the transformation process. And a blood splattered Nathan returns, ordering the kids away, seeming to realize what he's about to do, put their mom and brother out of their obvious misery. He puts the barrel to her face, and Teresa begins to whimper, which crushes Nathan, giving her a nice and juicy kiss, warmly telling her she will always be his golden lady, deciding to rather than kill her, get her some help, and goes on to talk about how everything is going to be fine and they're going to take that trip together they were talking about, clearly losing his grasp on the horrifying reality of the situation, and leaves instead of handling their little problem. And in a brief but pivotal scene, Ward takes an appointment with the mayor to warn her about the obvious concerns at the farm and the contamination in the water, but her plan to erect the reservoir is too far along and too important, overhearing that it will be acting as a water source for the entire east coast, obviously unwilling to heed his warning for her own personal benefit. Back at the ranch, Nathan takes a well-deserved break in his traditional living room spot, while his kids are ready to split, deciding to utilize Lavinia's horse, Comet, to get out of the area. But Comet was plagued by the purple as well, getting more agitated and getting loose from the bridle, disappearing into the night. Lavinia is undeterred, wanting to continue their journey on foot, but Benny knows there's no chance getting through 12 miles of ancient woods in the middle of the night, along with everything else going on, and he becomes swayed by its powers hearing what sounds like his dog Sam barking coming from the well. We don't actually see the dog down there, but there is a bunch of gross stuff accumulated in the bottom, and he foolishly still climbs down. The light below begins to radiate, electric branches rising up towards him and consuming him, dragging him down into the gross well water. Lavinia is heartbroken, but has no time to grieve, her fully unhinged father appearing and dragging her back inside. He does attempt to keep his anger at bay, claiming that he's not a monster like his father, but she realizes what he's gonna do, feed her to her mom, and through tears, she promises to clean up her act. He's way too far gone talking about them being a family, and one thing family do is stick together, throwing her into the room and locking the door. After all this, Nathan helps himself to another drink, clearly here seeing the ice cubes are luminescent, Nathan mumbling to himself about putting Teresa's favorite movie on and planning their supposed trip to no one completely alone in the room, at least until he's interrupted by some unexpected visitors, a suspicious ward and the sheriff. Nathan tries to play things off as normal, but there is too much to hide, like Teresa's whereabouts and the marks on his arms and everything. They ask about where his kids are, and again talking about how everybody is here because they stick together, well, that is except for Benny, who is in the well now, it's obvious that he's totally out of his gourd. And in a sense, because he knows what happened to his son, he and everything else has become a part of the cosmic entity. Hearing Lavinia screaming, the duo rush upstairs and burst the door down, seeing Teresa has become a grotesque spider-like creature. Nathan enters and blows her head off 
but the energy has gotten too deep into Lavinia regardless, purple emanating from under his skin. When attempting to get her to safety, the entity has other plans, the color emerging out of the well. Nathan comes out looking like he's about to shoot Ward, and the sheriff gets him first with a shot to the gut. As he fades away, his daughter joins him. She begs for him not to leave her, but his strength wanes and Nathan perishes. The sheriff attempts to call it in on the radio, and unsurprisingly getting no signal. He's more than ready to hit the road, but Lavinia knows better, saying the thing won't let them leave, which she knows after her many failed attempts to escape. Hearing noises from Ezra's cabin, he doesn't want to leave him out there, but Lavinia decides to stay behind, Ward promising to come back for her. Approaching his cabin, they hear a distorted recording of his voice going on about the entity, that it's all purple and glowing inside, sucking the life out of everything. Despite him seeming like a totally doped up loon, he did have the best handle on their otherworldly situation, continuing on that it lived in the well and grew down there, poisoning and changing everything into something that resembles the world that it came from to what it knows, meaning that all the bizarre mutations and what have you are in an attempt to make our world more like its own. It's also been feeding since its arrival and growing in power by stretching its reach, and that seems to have included consuming Ezra, now a mummified corpse all hollowed out. The color starts glowing out of his skin, filling the room and they run outside, creating a living tree monster that grabs the sheriff and absorbs him into the tree. Ward makes good on his promise to Lavinia, finding her standing at the well, calling it beautiful. She opens her eyes, a purple glow there as well as under his skin that gets more intense, then moving to Ward's eyes, everything becoming a weird head trip of colors. He is treated to a flash of our entity's home planet, a wondrous realization of Lovecraftian terror. All hard black edges and overwhelming worm monster things covering the entire surface. Looks nice! All with the big glowing rock in the sky. The formation created matching the symbol carved into Lavinia's forehead. Ward falls to the ground, all the grass starting to reach over and into his hands, the light becoming more intense, growing into a massive tunnel radiating out from the well. Lavinia outstretches her arms, the light energy all funneling into a large cloud in the sky, probably a wormhole. Her body dissolves away into pieces, becoming also part of the entity's energy. Well, so again, in a way, her ritual did work. She asked for protection and never did get hurt despite many chances for this to happen, and it did also allow her to get out of this place as she wanted, but getting turned into space dust is probably not what she had in mind. Ward 2 finds himself getting sucked into the funnel, the edges of his being getting pulled towards the light, a shadow copy of himself appearing on the ground. Just like with the family, he becomes affected by the energy, hearing the family's voices from many instances in their recent experiences, seeking refuge in the house. Nathan is back, at his usual spot in the chair, now further afflicted by his sting, boils and stuff growing on his face, and somehow still alive despite his gunshot wound moments ago, and again reinforcing the idea that those who are victims of the entity become a part of its whole, Nathan speaks in Lavinia's voice, referencing the first time that they met and thinking that he was flirting with her, seeing the entire family now sitting on the couch as they've all become a part of the energy's whole, and now also trapped in its time-bending nature, thusly reuniting the destroyed family in its alternate and separate outside time reality. This ties back to those other times it looked like Nathan was talking to nobody, because at that point, Ward hadn't been in contact with the energy, and now he can see them for himself. Nathan stumbles towards Ward, attacking him, and he gets down into the cellar, Nathan pounding on the door above to get in, the sound growing louder and becoming overwhelming, climaxing in all the bottles of wine exploding, and Nathan dissolves away, everything overwhelmed in a pure white light. And from what we can tell in the aftermath, the energy has left, all of what it harvested getting transported back to its home planet. The entire radius of the farm now just blackened, scorched earth. No life left behind, except for Ward, who managed to avoid getting sucked into its void, but is traumatized by this bizarre experience, especially as the mayor did go forward with the building of her massive reservoir, some of which included the Gardner family's land, essentially built right on top of where all this otherworldly contamination occurred. Yet with the family gone, uh, she was obviously able to easily purchase their land and execute her grand plan to provide the East Coast with water from the area. Which on first appearance does seem fine, I mean the thing left, went back to his planet and everything, Thing, so it should be all gone in the water in the area and whatever too, right? I don't think so. Ward at the reservoir says that the rest of the world already doesn't remember what happened during the strange days here and that thing that touched this place that cannot be quantified or understood by human science. He longingly dumps his cigarette butt into the water, the 
sky is still looking all magenta and otherworldly, implying things aren't as clean as the mayor might hope, which is further confirmed by that single colorful bug flying by. Indeed, not all the entity is gone, and its effects are still lingering in the area, which indicates that what we saw on the farm is due to happen on a much more widespread scale. I mean, the entire East Coast, like they said, which is actually a pretty frightening thing to consider. A chilling conclusion implying possible further destruction to come thanks to that colorful space jerk just looking for a food source. This brings us to the conclusion of this in-depth explained video on color out of space. I feel Richard Stanley did a wonderful job adapting the short story to the big screen, and I'm excited to learn he's actually intending on adapting two more Lovecraft works, with next up being another classic, The Dunwich Horror. So let's hope Stanley gets the chance to make those, because he obviously has a great handle on the source material. And also hopefully that it doesn't take, you know, another 20 years to put together. Get back to work, Stanley, you lazy bum. What did you guys think of Color Out of Space and its ending? Do you have any other lingering questions that I might have missed? What's your favorite Lovecraft film? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.